I've been around the Titanic artifacts for almost 20 years. And I've been alone with them, all of them. Not at odd times of the day, but just alone in a vault. And at no time did I ever have a premonition or an off presence feeling of any kind, positive or negative. They were simply objects. They were being studied. And when I was done, they went back in the box and they went back in the vault. I have never had any paranormal feelings coming off of either the artifacts or being there at the wreck site. You know, I didn't go down to Titanic, but I've been there. And there's really nothing to report. But um, I've got to tell you that I saw some things on the Queen Mary that have really changed my mind about uh, the other world. My first job in life was as a tour out on the Queen Mary, and once I was on board a few weeks, you start hearing stories that the ship is haunted. And the attitude of the management at the time was just tamp it down, don't discuss it, don't bring it up. Um, if somebody does see something odd on the tour, kind of talk them through it and talk them out of it. It was definitely something that was discouraged. Now, as a kid, I was I grew up in a secular household, and ghosts and that sort of stuff were mostly Halloween fun. Um, I certainly was not prepared to see anything. Uh, I didn't believe in that stuff. I was a strictly a, a rationalist. Now, the odd thing about these incidents, and there's three of them, is first of all, they're really not traditional hauntings. They're more like uh, trips to the night gallery. Odd things, inexplicable things you see, but nothing that you could actually construct you know, a Halloween story around. All of these incidents occurred back in 1979, and they all occur in a space of just a few days. The first incident, is probably the most traditional haunting in that I was stationed in the first class swimming pool as a guide. If you've ever been on the Queen Mary, the pool is in the bottom of a gallery. In other words, you have the pool, then you have the deck around the pool, and then you have a balcony, and then you have pillars supporting the ceiling. And there's only one way to get from the lower platform to the upper platform, and that's coming up a staircase that's in plain view. This is taking place about 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, the unwitching hour. And I was walking into the pool. And as I walk in, I see a young lady coming up the stairs. She's a little early for being a tourist, but not too early to be impossible. And I look down the, the length of the staircase and she's coming up. And the first thing that strikes me about her is how completely uh, unfashionable she's dressed. She's dressed out of the 1960s. I mean, straight out of Woodstock. Uh, she's a young woman. She's about 22. She's got long blonde hair. It comes right down to her waist. They used to iron their hair back in the day so that it hung straight down, almost in an unnatural way. She had that look. She also was wearing very dark uh, tortoise rim sunglasses, so I never saw her eyes. She was also wearing an orange vest that ended in a turtleneck. It was a burnt orange that was real popular in the late 60s. By the 70s, it would have been 10 years past the expiration date. You wouldn't look like a fool being dressed like that, but really that style had moved past and we were deep in the disco era. Now, I didn't see this woman out of the corner of my eye. I saw her face to face and I actually looked at her as she was coming up the staircase. Well, what I did was I crossed the staircase and then my vision was interrupted by a pillar. Pillar's about three feet wide. I got to the other side of the pillar, I lean over the balcony to greet her and ask if she has any questions about the first class swimming pool and this woman is gone. She can't have passed me and she could not have turned around and run to reach the entrance because the entrance is about 50 feet away from where she was standing. She was only out of the field of vision for about a second, two seconds, that was it. Now I never actually got creeped out 
there was no feeling of being threatened or anything. But I definitely got the impression I had seen an apparition. So what I did is I went all the way down to the end of the balcony where you could see the entire room. Nothing. Uh, then I started thinking about it and I realized aside from being really out of date, um, this woman didn't make any noise as she came up the stairs. The stairs on the Queen Mary are ceramic tile and at the time most of them were loose. So that whenever you came up there was this clatter of tiles and shoes and all that nonsense. This woman was perfectly silent. The other thing that was odd about her demeanor is when most people came into the pool they look up at the ceiling because it's all uh, faux mother of pearl. It's really quite impressive. She was looking down at the tank. She, her, her gaze never moved. She would looked down at the water's surface. And that really is it. It was just a strange vision. And there was no interaction between us. Like I mentioned, as she walked in the pool, her gaze was fixed on, on the pool tank at the water surface. She, she was moving. She did have locomotion coming up the steps, and her gait was uh, ordinary. You know, it was definitely a foot tread. She didn't float through the ether. But no, she never looked up at me, and of course, by the time I greeted her, she was gone. The entire vision of this woman lasted two seconds. It is the time it takes to walk, oh, four feet at a slow pace. Um, I will say that later when I was the, the acting curator, I went through the log books. Ship's log books must have all births and deaths on board. As far as I could tell, there were no deaths in the first class swimming pool. So who this woman was and what her connection to the place was, it isn't the classic, I was killed here or I drowned here. But at the same time, I have no idea. The next thing happened basically next week, the week following. Again, I was, uh, I was assigned to the bow. And in order to get there, I, you have to walk through the pool. Um, this was early in the morning again. This was before the tour opened. So I walked into the pool by myself, nobody there. And if you're familiar with the layout of the Queen Mary's pool, the balcony has a bulge at the after end of it. And maintenance had gone ahead and installed flood lamps, probably so the room could be cleaned. And that entailed drilling into vintage ceramic tiles. And I'm kind of alarmed how badly did they damage the tile. So I hopped the barriers and now I'm actually standing at the lip of the pool. Well, because there's a bulge in the balcony, the lip of the pool is here and what I need to see is about 18 inches over the pool, over the water. You know, I was young and agile at the time and to lean out 18 inches was, you know, not a challenge. And by the way, it was the shallow end of the pool. So I couldn't really get in any major trouble if I fell in. And I look up at the lights and then I simply lean over and I lean and I lean and I lean. And all of a sudden, I get the, uh, something grabbed me, grabbed me by the shoulder. And it meant business. And what it did is it pushed me over the pool. I lost my balance. I'm now just on one foot. And then as soon as I reached maximum, I was pulled back. I wasn't hurt. I didn't fall in. I'll tell you, as a matter of fact, I was afraid, not that I was being touched by something, but I was trying to think it now, well, how am I going to explain being sopping wet with this uniform? I'm going to have to admit to being somewhere I shouldn't. Um, pulled me back, and in essence, that is the end of the story. Now, for the next hour or two, I had red marks on both sides of my shoulder where I was contacted. but. Aside from that, just that prank, that random prank, that was it. There was nothing to see, I didn't hear anything, and my hackles didn't go up. 
you know, I didn't get a sense of dread or foreboding or malevolence. It was just an incident and it was over. I went upstairs and I did my job. The last incident was maybe about a week or two after that. And now it's the end of the day. Uh, sunset, and we're getting ready to close the tour down and, and all go home. And I was standing up on the bow, and the tourists are getting very sparse. You know, they're coming through every 15 minutes or so, so there's just a lot of time standing there and admiring things. You know, it is California, and it is, it's summer, so we're lightly dressed. And I'm just basically looking back at the, the superstructure and the funnels and sort of just zoning out and not thinking about anything in particular. And then something happens, and it's very difficult to describe because it happens in a moment. As fast as you can clap your hands, it's gone. What happened was, as I was standing there looking aft, suddenly I was standing in that spot, but it's 1966. It's the end of the ship's life, and I can feel and see in, in a non-specific way. Um, the crewmen were in New York. It's the middle of winter. I am freezing because I'm misdressed for the weather. There's snow on the deck, and the crew is getting ready to cast off. We're heading back to England. And I can feel this depression. They've retired the Mary, they're gonna retire the Elizabeth, and there's only one ship coming online. And that means guaranteed at least 50% of the crew is losing its job in a matter of months. What are they going to do? That was the ambient feeling I picked up. At the same time I was seeing this, I was up in the wheelhouse, in the chart room, and I was looking over one of the ship's officers, and I remember he was standing at a chart table and had the chart out and a pencil and paper, and he was figuring something out. I don't know what it was. It was over like that. And at the same time, I'm down in the bakery, and I remember seeing a baker pick up a tray and put it in an oven. And then that was that image. Then I was down in the generator room. I was on the platform watching a generator, uh, watching a, an engineer parallel two generators because they brought a second generator online and now they're gonna split the load. And at the same time, I was up in a cabin somewhere. I think it was one of the second class cabins. The steward had come in to run the cotton cold water taps before passengers arrived. Because if a cabin hasn't been used in a while, there's a tendency for rust to collect and it will bleed rusty water for about 10 seconds. You never want to see a passenger see that. So the stewards had instructions to go ahead and, and do that. And I saw that and bang, that was done. And in a moment, all of these, these visions, uh, which occurred simultaneously, no sound, there's no, no verbiage. There's also really no motion. It's like looking at a series of stills, still pictures. It was gone. It was absolutely gone. And 10 seconds later, up comes the last set of uh, tourists. And I give my spiel as usual. And then five minutes later, my supervisor arrives and I go home. This is, this, is, this is literally the only ghost stories from my life. Um, I've never had anything else. I want to let you know, uh, when I worked in management, I was on board the ship all the time. Uh, I slept on board many times. I was in a lot of areas that are traditionally supposed to be haunted. I never saw anything funny down in the shaft alley. I never saw anything funny anywhere else. This was it, and at the end of that, that third apparition, there's, there's never been anything else. Watertight door 13 in the stern where they say someone got cut mm -hmm. in half. Isn't that not even originally 13? No, it is. That is the correct numbering uh, for the time of the accident. 
and it was a real accident. And the man's name was John Petter. He, as I remember, these are old memories. As I remember, he was recently signed up to the ship. And they were closing the watertight doors as a matter of routine. And those doors have a bell that rings in advance before the door moves. Uh, I don't remember what it is, but I remember it being generous. It's like 30 seconds or a minute. And Petter, for whatever reason, and we'll never know why, decided that he was going to chicken the door and, and jump through it. And the door caught him and he was crushed. As I recall, the, the nature of the, the damage, the injury, was from the collarbone across the sternum to about where the liver is. And he was, I, he was not pinched in half, but you know, that's, there was nothing left of that midsection. It's supposed to have two people um, to actually control the door. One holds the handle open, the guy, one, his partner goes through, he holds the, the handle the other side while the other one goes through. Well, this kid tried to do it on his own and he got caught and it, uh, and it completely crushed him. Uh, we had to, uh, we had to make room, it, it was on the way out, so we had to keep the body uh, in our freezer. We actually had to empty out a fruit locker freezer um, and put the body in there. Now, I've been down there several times. I have never seen anything go on that's weird there. The Queen Mary has really taken on the identity of one of the most haunted places in the United States, if not the world. Um, perhaps it's the fact that it's an old ship. It's a relic of an era that is completely gone. There are no more ocean that, Yeah, it's that allure of yeah. the past and her huge, long history. Just like any famous old um, hotel that was once dilapidated, perhaps, that's in a major city. You know, it has a history of violence or death or anything, or traumatic events, you know. They generate some sort of stories throughout its career. Death on ships is very common. In fact, every cruise ship there is has actually body storage facilities. I hate to say it, but a lot of people who are in their retirement come on board those ships. They drink excessively. They have a very exciting few days, and it does sometimes take its toll. On these old ships, they, um, they had similar situations. Death was common, as was birth on these ships. Yeah. And, uh, especially and the old ones were still dangerous places, too. Yeah. It wasn't safe always to travel across the ocean back in the the 30s, 40s, and even the 50s, especially not the 40s, but yes. Yeah. In the 40s, of course, we had a little thing I like to call the Second World War. It was a little thing, yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, it was carrying troops on board the Queen Mary, and uh, some of them were killed. They had wounded on board. Mm -hmm. and um, She had a couple of accidents, too, yeah. during World War II that were resulted in a major losses of life. So the Queen Mary certainly has the colorful history you would expect with any sort of haunted house. So we've each been on board the Queen Mary a few times, but this last time had three incidents. They were three for me, and you had one. Maybe. Well, it was a shared one yeah. together. Maybe. All right. Mm -hmm. He's still skeptical. Yeah. I enjoy a good mm -hmm. story. Um, it's a story. Indeed. It is a good yeah, story. Yeah. But maybe. We'll see. Jury's still out. Chronologically speaking, though, my first two incidents happened earlier, one of which was... I think the second night I was on board the ship on my most recent visit, which was a few months ago, maybe back in, uh, back in February or March. And uh, in my room, in my cabin, which was one of the old period rooms, I heard music. This was late at night. They wouldn't have had music playing out in the hallways because people were trying to sleep and everyone knows those walls are really thin. But it was music, it was old fashioned 40s music, and I could actually identify the musician, it was Glenn Miller. It's one of the most common musicians of the era, but still, it was Glenn Miller. It sounded like In the Mood, which is, again, one of the most popular songs from the era. So I was listening around the room. I was trying to uh, listen up against the walls, see if it was maybe the neighbors playing it, or maybe it was coming from above or below, and I was listening into the vents, and 
the only place I could actually hear it was the center of the room. And I was not the only one who witnessed this either. This music lasted for at least a minute or two, uh, or potentially as long as the song. It's not that long of a song, so I, I don't know. And it just kind of faded out. But it was 40s music. Now, I was listening to 40s music earlier on my iPod, so I don't know, maybe it was my imagination, maybe, maybe someone was playing and I just couldn't pinpoint the source. The following night, Emma and I were out exploring the ship at about 12.30, and um, no one else was really about. We were wandering, and, and uh, we went down to our deck, which is the lowest level of the main staircase, and this is the level where the dining room is, behind the stairs, and where it comes out into the swimming pool, which is locked off, but you can go up to the doorway. It's dark in there, you can't really see much, but you can look through the glass. And uh, we, were, we were looking in, we were trying to peek through. And as we were doing this, we heard a footstep coming down the stairs behind us. And it was a high heel on linoleum. It was so distinct and clear that we just kind of turned around, expecting to see someone else coming down the stairs, but no one was there and there was only one footstep. And it took a few seconds for it to actually dawn on us. The stairs are carpeted, but they were linoleum at the time of the Queen Mary's career. So again, that as an isolated incident might not have been much, but um, following the previous night where we heard music, it was, it was starting to get a little weird. I was asleep. Yes, you were. Mm -hmm. You were asleep. I invited you to come out because yep. we had work to do. Yep. But we are, you aren't going to do any work. I recorded yeah. sound effects. Uh huh. Uh huh. Anyway, we were exploring the ship, having a little bit of fun. There You're was no one fun, else. You said that's oh, not recording sound effects. Okay. Were you there? Uh, I heard. Were the you story. there? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe I was. Maybe I was the ghost. Continue. And you were wearing high heels, uh, hey, which doesn't don't, surprise me. Don't. That's what I do in my spare time on the Queen Mary is none of your business. <laughs> and then finally the next night, which I believe was the final night we were spending on the ship, mm -hmm. we had a very successful business meeting. It was a great day, and we went to the observation lounge. I said, you know what, let's celebrate for a little bit. Let's go back to my room, and uh, we'll have a bottle of wine, we'll talk about the meeting today, and we'll talk about our plans from here. And that was the plan. So I brought a bottle of wine, and I got three glasses from the lounge, and we brought them back to my cabin. And we sit down, I open the bottle, and I'm starting to pour the glasses. None of us have taken a sip yet. I'm, I'm making that very clear, none of us have taken a sip yet. And um, the world knows you love your wine. The world does. So the cabin is oriented where there's the side of the ship, the hull, and there's the bed, and then there's the bathroom. Down a corridor. Down, down a corridor. And my back is to the bathroom facing the hull of the ship, and uh, it's Emma to my left and Matt to my right, and I'm pouring the bottle. And earlier in the day, at like seven in the morning, the cleaning lady came to the door and was knocking and said, do you want me to do the room up? And this was a very odd hour for them to have come. I think you were just talking about her before this happened. Yeah, right? I was just talking about how this the cleaning lady came at such an odd hour this oh, morning. Oh, you know, and we were also making, you're also playing music again. I was playing music. So we playing, thought we were being loud. I was playing creepy 30s music. Yeah, so, so we thought we were being too loud and that we were gonna we we're about to get in trouble. So the doorknob rattles very aggressively, and I'm thinking, it's uh, the cleaning lady again. What, what is she doing? It's it's mm -hmm. it's ten o'clock at night. And I thought it was I thought it was security trying to like come in and be like turn down that music. Yeah, kids. that that too. Um, but Emma looked in the direction of the door, and she distinctly saw it was the door handle to the bathroom, and then it swung open. Now that door doesn't fall open or anything like that. It did not have a tendency to do that. Um, and even if it did, why would it rattle so much before it does? I'm not happy about this at all. So I'm gonna go back to my modernized state right now. This Can we come back with you? The door to our bathroom was closed. I, the, the scariest thing is I heard the doorknob turn. That was the doorknob turning. The doorknob turned. 
And then it opened. <laughs> they put the lights on tonight. Now it's 12.06 and um, we were sitting here in my cabin, B447. I'm on the, shit. On the Queen I'm, Mary. I'm upset. <laughs> on the Queen Mary. Well, that's it. That was it, yeah. The ship settled, made noise, opened the door. Mm -hmm. The end. The wind Got came drunk. in and, and gripped the doorknob. There's and... a lot of dust, no, or dust orbs, you know. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a logical explanation for this. Yep. Mm -hmm. It might have been the cleaning lady trapped in the bathroom, and then Could've she been. jiggled it really hard, panicking, and then she found another way out. She's skittle, she got right out of there as fast as she could. Drain. Yeah. Another story, though, which was not a ghostly experience for myself, but instead for other people on the ship while we were there. Emma and I dress vintage sometimes. We love dressing from the 40s or even the 30s sometimes. It's just something we like to do. We, we like taking vintage style photographs, especially on board the Queen Mary where you're in the proper setting for this. And um, we decided just for fun, I was gonna throw on some 1940s style pajamas and she did the same. And we um, just walked around the ship. We wandered the hallways a little bit. And we're, we come to one of the corridors where you can see a, a decent length of the ship, not the whole length, but at least a, a, a few, a few, uh, few hundred feet. And then we're standing there looking down that way. And then a group of teenagers or something come out from a side corridor about a hundred feet down and they're looking at us and they freeze. And they're like, oh my gosh. And they're terrified and then they start walking away across the ship now you can you can go to the other side of the ship and there's another corridor identical but mirrored and um, we stood there until they disappeared and then we ran to the opposite side of the ship and now we were here on the other side of the ship in the other corridor and then we stood there and we stopped and we were able to freeze before they got across to this corridor and then they came there and they saw us again and they freaked out and ran so fast in the opposite direction. It was great. And we actually managed to jump away before any of them peeked back. So if they did peek back, we were gone. So um, I'm sure they are telling that story to other people and it's just adding to the legacy of how haunted the Queen Mary is. And maybe they've watched this video and now they have closure. They went insane. <laughs>